Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of SCAA News. This is episode 17. Interview with David Haddock. Yes, I was able to score yet another CIG employee for an interview. Oh, I guess I should mention, I'm Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo. <laughs> well, anyway, just stay tuned. We're going to get through the news as quickly as possible because David's interview went over 25 minutes. So I don't want to do a 25 minute news segment and then have you sitting here for 50 minutes. So first things first, new schedule for programs from CIG. Monday, 6 p.m., 10 from the chairman. These are all Eastern Standard Times, GMA, GMT, <laughs> minus five. Wednesdays, 12 p.m., you have Wingman's Hangar. Fridays, 6 p.m., you have the next grade starship. So you have all three programs, all three wonderful programs, being aired separately. No more um, of this stuffing everything into Friday with Wingman's Hangar actually absorbing 10 from the chairman and then also having 10 for the chairman being out there on its own. So you have all three distinctly different shows all bringing us different information. I love it. It's wonderful. So when we go back through the week and we look at what's been going on, I was looking at the news on Monday going, oh, there's not a lot to do. And then I realized I aired my show on Thursday, and that's pretty much why there wasn't that much news. So it's Wednesday, it's snowpocalypse, I'm looking outside, more like icepocalypse, 2.0 outside in Atlanta, and I'm doing the show again. So now I have a lot of news to talk about, I'm just going to pull little bits and pieces out of it. So we'll talk about Wingman's Hangar at the end of this, and some news items that were brought out of there. Let's talk about the next great starship. That happened on Friday. This is Season 1, Episode 2. We had another eight teams go in, another five teams come out, and three more teams added to the wild card pool. The winners this week were Team Troika, Team Belafonte, Team Vision Cut, Team Tri Tri, and Team Catapult. The first four being unanimous decisions, and the last one being by a popular vote, not by unanimous. Um, I think that Chris and his team have a very hard time at this one, because although some of them didn't equal the others, there is a lot of talent in these, and there are times when I feel like the groups overshadow the individuals that have entered the contest, and it's not fair because that individual might have done everything and still provided us with a wonderful, wonderful view into a piece of weaponry. The winner of this is going to have their ship added in game. Of course, all of the um, runners-up may or may not. Their, um, their items are going to become property of CIG when it's over. My question would be, I don't know how mods are going to work, and I guess this is a question I should go back to the uh, developers forums and ask, but I think mods are only going to be able to add be added to the private servers as it could unbalance the game, so you're not going to be able to see just anybody's ship in the game unless it comes through the CIG staff. Of course, on a private server, you can see any ships that you want because it's going to be something that's put together by an individual and has its own set of rules. So this week we have another eight teams, another three teams that are going to be in the wild card pool. What that means is after Friday's show, which is two days from now, you're going to have to vote on which one of those nine teams that are in the wild card pool becomes the 16th contestant in the next great star citizen as we move into the uh, final weeks of the competition. Uh, final. I guess it's the buildup of the final. Um, there's still probably going to be 13 weeks left. All right, so what I've got then was going to be the 10 for the chairman. 10 for the chairman featured quite a number of questions that had to do with various different things this week. And what I like to pull out is just two items. The first item I'm going to pull out is there was a question that, that kind of sort of had to do with the look and feel and immersion factor of the different areas of the universe, well, of the galaxy. And Chris answered the question by saying, each one of the different zones is going to have a very different feel, whether it be Lawless or UEE or Vandal, Banu or Xi'an. Each one will have its own elements, its own build. Of course, I think Lawless is going to be a hodgepodge of everything, 
but he gave examples of like looking at the ship designs and stuff. And I think that this is quelling some people's fear. I never had this as a fear. I knew based on prior, you know, games I played from Steve, from Steve, he's so much like Steve, I call him Steve, um, from Chris, is that, yeah, there there is going to be a vastly different look and feel and atmosphere to each one of the groups. The second one I'm going to pull out of the nine that he answered is going to be about um, somebody that said, hey, listen, I own an address and I own these other ships too. I have a couple of Hornets on the same account. Could I put them in my address? Now, of course, we know that the address is built to carry three Hornets because we've read the lore, right? Well, anyway, um, the way that I, I look at this is that Chris answered it by saying, each one of the things that you own, a hangar, a ship, is going to have its own inventory. And the bigger the ship, the more it could hold and possibly ships. So you just have to add your ship to its inventory. Um, my question then becomes, what if my address is on in, um on the Sheehan border and my Hornet is on the Van Duel border. I can't just drag and drop it over, right? So my guess is that is the case, but they have to be in the same zone for you to be able to do that. That is a reach, but I know how Chris is with immersion. That's probably what's going to be going on with that. He answered quite a number of other questions, and I do say that Chris does a wonderful job with this. Go out there, watch 10 from the, from the chairman, and if you are a subscriber, make sure if you have a question, you put it into the thread. It is a sticky at the top of the subscriber stand. Oop, I mentioned that again, didn't I? <laughs> um, there was an article that is going to be released, or was released, or is released, um, in PC Gamer, which is a German magazine, and the front cover... Well, the cover story is going to be about Star Citizen, and there were quite a number of images that were released as part of this. A lot of them were pulled right out of the, the commercial, but there are a couple, like this one. That's the asteroid hangar entrance, I believe, and I think it's gorgeous. I love the immersion factor, and I hope it looks as good in-game, except for all those little meteorites or meteors or asteroid lits, little tiny things. I hope my insurance is paid on my ship and that my shields could keep them away from it. Um, there's also this mining barge shop thing. And, of course, the harvester, which we read about, if we did read, in the Galactic Guide for the Grinder, I think it was. I forget the name of the system. But it talked about these things on one of the planets where there were thousands of wrecks of UEE and Vandal ships, and they were just coming up getting on top of it and just breaking down the matter and making it able to be able to produce their own ships and their own goods. And, you know, it's a big ship. I think to get the relationship of, you know, just to get what's relative, how big this is, look at how small the people are in that actual picture. All right, there's uh, just one more shot here. It's, I, I don't know what it is, but it's pretty good looking. All right, so we had some more law. We had Sesson Part 2, which of course is the undercover reporter that's looking on the freelancer privateer pirate issue and trying to get inside one of the groups and report on it. We had an update on the Davian system, which is the system where humans first met the Banu. And of course we have an update, which is just, um, it's in addition to a Senate hearing that we read about um, probably two weeks ago where they were having a debate over whether or not to let a Xi'an um, Xi'an um, business open up in UEE space, a maintenance facility or um, service station. And this is the grand opening of one of them. They're talking about it. And you're starting to see how the lore comes together. And one of the reasons I had David on the show was to like ask him some of those questions. Do you know it's only two people on his team, him and somebody else? amazing with all the stuff that we have coming out. All right, that is going to be it, I think, for news. No, it's not. We have Wingman's Hangar to talk about. All right, two more items. All right, we're going to talk about Wingman's Hangar, and then we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about Wingman's Hangar. Um, well, actually, we'll talk about the second piece also. So it's Wednesday, Wingman's Hangar was on this morning, and we had quite a lot of stuff that was in there. And because some of you didn't watch it, I'm not going to go deep, deep, deep into it. I'm going to pull out the major things that we saw. We This one was all about PBR and the Vandal Scythe, okay? 
And it, it essentially showed us how important, again, we already saw, saw this with the Avenger, but PBR, they used the um, ancient model of the teapot, which goes back to 1975, and ex explained in this um, episode how they needed to render. It was the first time it did something like that back then. And now everybody uses it. I, I guess it's not as an inside joke. It's just as like something to go to. Um, but he was showing the PBR on how, what, how it could change like the look and feel of this teapot. And then the uh, developer left, and we got Chris Olivia talking to um, Eric about the Vandal Scythe. And, oh my lord. It's another beautiful piece of graphics. And when people look at the, you know, not competitors, but the other space sims out there, like Elite Dangerous, which is coming out um, real soon, and is in alpha and having a very successful um, alpha multiplayer test, and saying that, why isn't Star Citizen there? This is why. Chris isn't just making a game. He's trying to make the game that he's always wanted to make. One that looked and felt so real, you you just couldn't believe that you were anywhere else but in the game. And this stuff is just amazing. And Chris has uh, talked, Chris Olivia, has talked to us about how important it is and how they're going back on some of the old assets that were really just started for the um, for, for the original rendering of the intro movie. You know the the you know. I'm sorry to fall over my words. Most of the time, it's the rubber bands and my braces. But this is this is a amazing rework of the Vandal Scythe, and they talk a little bit more in detail about like the you know eight foot Vandals and having to think about how a human would be able to pilot this at the same time. I'm very impressed by it. It's gorgeous work, and I can't wait to see things like the Freelancer and the Connie and the Auroras and other ships have the same detailing. Um, rework on top of them when PBR hits the actual hangar module. All right, we've got a hangar update coming. We heard this from Eric in one of the questions, and that is probably going to be a. We also heard it from Chris in Ten for the Chairman. It's probably going to be one of those maintenance ones where there's not a lot that we see on the surface, but you have to dig deep. Of course, they'll probably get rid of the Christmas wreaths. I think that's the question that was answered last week. Um, but they're also probably going to go live with the world servers, which needs to happen because they announced that the DFM is going to be out, be seen for the first time, unveiled at PAX East, which is very important because Sandy put that, that poll out there for us to answer if we were going or not. Now, I'm not going because I don't have the money, and uh, I wish I could, but... I know that they're probably going to live stream it, and they're going to have the actual dogfighting module there for everyone to see and hopefully play with. Fingers crossed. They also said that the uh, dogfighting module would probably be out shortly thereafter. So, a lot came out of Wingman's Hangar and 10 for the Chairman this week. So, we're getting this patch in the next week or so, and then there's not going to be another patch until the DFM, according to what Eric said today. So I guess that means no new ships for a while. Hmm. I guess that's something we're all going to have to live with. All right, I'm going to finish the news there. I know there's more. Oh, I'm going to let these pictures go by in the background. There are things that were in the jump point for those of us that are subscribers and just got unveiled to the rest of the world here on the you know middle of February. So take a look. This is the work in progress, the rework of the Vanduul. What's up next? Two things. Let's talk real quick about Confessions of a Star Citizen. I want everyone to know that this is not about confessions about how many ships you buy. And that's pretty much where this contest has been going. People have been talking about how many ships that they buy. Of course, the last one that I read, I read because it was talking about a single ship. A love for the ship, the Avenger or the Cutlass. I am not looking for you to be great writers. When I wrote mine, I just wrote down what I went through. I saw the game, I bought myself an Aurora, I melted it, and I bought myself a 300i. I melted that, I moved up to a 325a, I melted that, I went to a 
freelancer and then started over and bought an Aurora and then started the melt-in process again. Listen, I want everybody to have an equal shot at being able to win this contest. It doesn't have to be that you're a shipaholic. I just want to know what your story is. Why do you love the game? Why do you trust Chris? What's drawing you into Star Citizen? It doesn't have to be a work of art. It doesn't. Listen to the prior 16 shows. Some of them are just very basic. Some of them are really detailed. I will read it if it's good enough to read. And if I read it on this show, like the one that I'm going to be reading at the end of the show, it will go into the monthly contest where it will be voted on inside the Star Citizen AA forums on our website, StarCitizenAA.com, and the winner this month gets an Avenger package. Next month, it will be something different. I'm just going to be giving that out each month and letting you all enter every time. Second contest, it's for the enablers only, the official organization of Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous. So we have um, somebody in our group that became a completionist, has a bunch of extra ships, and what we're doing is we have a two-tiered contest. The first tier of it is very simple. The enablers was borrowing the rehab is not an option um, motto of the show. They are going to be changing that to something. What's the new tagline for the enablers? I like the, mm, just one more ship, but then again, that might not be it. The, the whole contest is just come up with a tagline, and the winner is going to get a freelancer. And I think that's a freelancer package. Let's just say it's a freelancer, $110 freelancer. There'll be a second prize and a third prize. If you want to join the organization, you can take part in this contest. This is an organization-only contest at this point. Sorry. Next thing up is, if you want me to cover Elite Dangerous, please put a comment in this video down below. I'm trying to force myself into covering it. I love the game. I always did. I've played every version of Elite that it's ever come out. I don't have 200 pounds British sterling. I think that's how you say it. I don't. And I want to cover it because I'm going to be talking to the community manager and also to the creative director from the Elite Dangerous team. And their interviews are going to show up in the Star Citizen AA thread. And I can't wait for that. But I have not touched the game. And, you know, when I paid $275 for my Connie, I got a whole bunch more with it. I don't see that. And I don't know if that same value is there. Someone tell me if it is. Please remember that donations do help the show go on. They help with buying the contest gifts and other things that we do here. Um, everything that I'm looking at in front of me right now is provided to me by donations to the show, um, except for the iMac that I own and the green screen and lights. I say that every time. But everything else, the camera, the tripod, the boom mic, the boom mic stand, all that stuff were purchased with money that you all were more than um, gracious to give the show. And if you do give more, there is some other equipment and things that we can do to make the show better. That's it. Stay tuned. Like I said, David Haddock, and then Confession of a Star Citizen Addict. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Star Citizen AA. This is Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo and today I have another special guest from CIG. Today we're joined by David Haddock, the lead writer from CIG. Hello David, how are you today? Good, how are you doing? Doing great. I really appreciate you coming on, so thank you very much up front because I think we're going to be doing this pretty quick. Thank you. You're welcome. So David, I start off the show pretty much, or I should say the interviews, with the same question to everybody. Could you remember the first computer that you owned, that you gamed on? Uh, I do. It was a uh, Epson Equity 2 uh, that my mom bought because she was working for a computer science professor who had a deal with Epson. And I remember my brother and I were very upset because um, at the time everybody had Commodores and there were no games for PC, so uh, it was uh, very slim pickings when it came to stuff to buy and stuff to play. So uh, 
So yeah, I think my first game was King's Quest Two, and my brother's was uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Infocom. Oh, I remember those. So you're dating yourself with those a little bit, growing up in that era that Chris was actually producing games. Yep. Uh, yeah, I had I bought uh, Wing Commander, and I remember selling. I got a job at the Babbage's computer store. I remember selling Wing Commander Two. Great. Yeah, that's where I believe I bought two and three. Well, no, I think I had to get them somewhere else because I had moved at the time. But I remember buying the first two there. Yeah, I couldn't actually. I didn't have a computer fast enough to run three, so I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get it. So. Chris is evil that way. Always making us buy new computers, whatever game. Right. Yeah. Um, so, what was the first game that you actually got addicted to? Or uh, stopped to <laughs> I think my, I don't know, the, the one that, it was, it's probably a game by Maxis back in the day called a Robosport, uh, which was a uh, turn-based robot tactical fighting game. So it was like guns and stuff, it was like burnt out arenas, but you could actually play it online. Uh, and so you could, uh, but it was turn-based, so you would do your moves, the other player would do their moves, and then it would compile everything together. Uh, but there wasn't a single player to do it, but it was like kind of amazing because you just never got bored of it because it was always a different, uh, and battles would always play out differently. And you could have different sized teams and different points to allocate and stuff like that. But I played, I think I played that game until uh, my computer literally couldn't run it. It just, it just, like, it wouldn't even write back the discs. It was just not. Okay. So, uh, when, you know, back then, did you think that you were going to have a career in the game industry? Um, not really. I mean, I, I played a lot of games, and I, well, at the time, I was, I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to be in the FBI. Uh, and then I, high school, I seg segued over into movies. Uh, when I did movies, and so then I was mostly movie focused for, for the bulk of it. Okay. Um, what what ex what career were you in before coming into the game industry and subsequently into CIG? Uh, I was I worked in movies. I did a I had a uh, initially started out. I was a location sound mixer uh, in New York on very very low budget movies. Uh, when I moved out to LA, I had. Uh, I did have a brief stint as a game tester at Activision, uh, working in the graveyard ship, uh, while I was interning for uh, Chris's production company during the day. Uh, and so then from that I got, I was a director's assistant on a movie called Outlander, and did, I was a PA, did behind the scenes videography, all sorts of, whatever I could do to kind of keep myself valuable. Uh, I, okay. I ended up doing. So it was mostly a lot of movie stuff, freelance stuff, uh, um, before. Oh, well, you know, it's a lot of the work that you tell me that you did isn't really in the field of writing. No. Did you publish anything before coming to CIG or? Nope. Um, I mean, I, I wrote screenplays pretty much in my free time. Uh, anytime I wasn't working on a set, I would I would be trying to write scripts and get them out to people, and that was the primary reason why I moved to Los Angeles uh, initially in New York. I was just doing, like I said, I was doing sound crew stuff, and um, felt like I needed a change to focus, try and focus more on writing. And New York was is a great town if you if you're working on set, but the, a lot of the decision makers aren't there. So uh, I was like, you know, I'm going to try and go do a change of scenery, and you know, hopefully try and make some traction on on writing. So, but yeah, it was up until this basically it was all nights, early mornings, weekends working on script. Okay. What was the most memorable moment you had in before coming to CIG in that career? Uh, it was probably, actually I would probably say it was on, on Outlander. Uh, there was a, when I first started working on it, we had basically eight weeks of uh, pre-production like concepting, storyboarding, animatics and stuff like that. And uh, they had hired uh, a team of concept artists, uh, one of which was Brian Church, who's, on, who's been working on this, and uh, Ian McKay, and uh, all sorts of people, basically 
put up everyone in a room with the director and the producers and basically put them in an office and spent eight weeks just drawing uh, props, characters, costumes, storyboards, uh, everything. And just, but plotting out the entire movie and using that as a way to uh, raise funds to, to make the movie. And it was just, it was an amazing experience to be able to go into work every day and see these really smart and really talented people just brainstorming and coming up with cool stuff. Uh, so that was probably one of my, my favorite Okay. It sounds a lot like what you're doing today. <laughs> Only a lot more hours, right? Um, so how did, so I mean, that kind of almost makes the next question a moot point, but what brought you to Cloud Imperium Games? Uh, well, like I said, I, I, I knew Chris just just because I worked for him for, uh, I mean, I was on that movie for two and a half years. Uh, so I got to know Chris. I got to know the director. I got to know uh, John Schimmel, who's also uh, been been helping out. Uh, and after that, I sort of focused, decided I was going to try and take some time to focus on on writing. So I was uh, uh, ended up talking with Chris about another possible film script uh, collaboration type thing. So we worked on that for a while, um, and you know. Uh, it ended up falling apart just as, as scripts tend to do, but uh, we worked on it for, for a couple months. But um, yeah, it was a good experience because we got to get the, the dialogue going and you know bounce, get to a very comfortable place where we could bounce ideas off of each other, and there was not like uh, you know feelings hurt or you know whatever. If I presented something and you didn't like it, I wasn't going to take it personal and get angry and something. So hopefully, okay. I'm building like a good work on the board. Understanding of the common language. And stuff. All right. So when Chris pitched the Star Citizen project to you, what was your first thought? Uh, it was uh, gnawing fear because uh, I'd never done anything like this before, uh, and I said such. Um, it's a very different discipline and a very unique discipline uh, because just by the interactivity alone, adds a very weird aspect to designing a storyline. With movies, it's very it's, it's a one-way process. You kind of come up with something and it's, the audience is there for the ride. You know, this is, you're, you're letting them participate and you want them to feel like they're a part of it. Uh, and so it's a very, very different thing. So that was worrying for me personally just because I was outside of my wheelhouse so much. But I mean, also the scope of how he was pitching it and, you know, seeing the demo and it was just, I mean, it was incredible to see so uh, okay so you came in after the actual first pitch at gamescon back in no, 2012? no I, was, uh, I was i came on the august where we met the first time the august uh, i think it was august uh of 2010 okay. and he had been building it was an early prototype of the demo that he ended up debuting at, at, at gamescon uh but in that sort of early phase, we were sort of, he, he just had a very loose idea of kind of what he wanted to tackle. Uh, and it was more just sort of this, that, the feeling that he wanted to, to, to capture. So okay. initial conversations were just sort of very basic, you know, what's the universe like? You know, what's the setup? You know, all these sorts of things. And that's what ended up leading to uh, the time capsules, which started the September 10th before, the month before the, the Gamescom thing. So, okay. Yeah. So, what, can you explain to us your responsibilities, day-to-day -day responsibilities at CIJ? Uh, it's sort of a three-tiered. I like to think of it as a three-tiered approach. Uh, there's Squadron Forty Two stuff, which is you know uh, working on script, developing characters, and writing dialogue, re rewrites, trying to plot out. Um, and we've we've, we've Agreed upon where the story is going, but you know, once you get into the, the nuts and bolts of telling a story, it's always going to change stuff. Uh, so it's a lot of that. Plus, there's the system universe stuff, which is at the moment um, writing out system descriptions, planetary systems and descriptions, and stores, and you know, all sorts of things. And plus, more macro, kind of broad scale things like uh, what's what are phases of architecture, you know, what are the society, what are the banding societies look like, all these sorts of things to sort of 
on any given day, kind of yeah. popping up as things that need to get done. And then there's the third part, which is sort of the community-based stuff. So the Spectrum dispatches, news updates, you know, reviewing the Spectrum dispatch stuff that uh, David Ledyman sends over, um, the Ask a Dev thread, you know, all those sorts of things. So it's yeah, yeah. basically it's kind of popping like a madman between what any of those three uh, right. are there. You seem to be the most active one of the devs on the Ask a Dev thread. When I go out there and I look at it, sometimes 20 of the questions answered in a row are all yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately trying to keep ahead of the tide. Uh, it's, uh, you know, fortunately there's not, I don't get slammed too much, so I, and I tend to do it, I'll do a first pass when I get in the morning and then when I'm working at lunch. Uh, and But also at the same time, and I, I think I mentioned this uh, on the, the thread, but you know, I'm, I'm in a kind of unique position because a lot of this stuff, because we've had the writer's guide and the lore builders and time capsules and spectrum dispatches and stuff, you know, there's a lot of the, the information about the lore is already out there, so I, I just get to offer clarity. Uh, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, the same things that the designers have to worry about, which is they're building these systems and mechanics and stuff like that, and so they might not be in a position where they can really talk about it. So a lot of the stuff I'm, I get to talk about is already kind of out there and some form or another, and if it's not, then I just make up a glib excuse and... <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. I, I'm, I've been quite impressed with the way that you have the community interacting with you and with the way that the actual Persistent Universe, and to a lesser extent, maybe Squadron 42 is moving. What first brought about your idea to incorporate the ideas, the stories, the, the, you know, what, what the community had to offer you? Uh, well, I mean, that was, part of that was, was, I mean, it was mostly Chris. I mean, you know, he wanted to keep the community involved and it, you know, it's a, it's a interesting process doing a game in this, in this way, you know, I mean, I always kind of fall back to the explanation. It's like Star Wars came out and then people could respond to Star Wars, but if Star Wars released all of their lore while they were making Star Wars. It's been a very different process. No uh, Jar Jar Banks. Uh, but um, but yeah, you know, it's you know, it's also it's just it's so big, and you know, part of the the fun about these things feeling really fleshed out and lived in is that they're kind of not coming from one person. Like you want that variety, you want that sort of flavor that multiple people can bring to the process. Uh, you know, obviously, within reason, you don't want things to get too crazy, but, uh, but yeah, you know, as, I mean, as we see every day on our site, you know, the community is really creative, and there's a lot of smart people who know a lot of interesting things about different subjects and stuff like that, so it's, it's kind of, kind of a waste not to take advantage of a resource like that. Right. Um, you, you brought up Star Wars, so I'm going to bring up something that worries a lot of us in the community. In, in the sci-fi genre, there are so many breaks in continuity of story from, you know, the way it's presented in, say, a first film to the way it expands over time. With the player, with the player universe and Squadron 42 both being dynamic storylines, I mean, I'm assuming that, right? What things are you doing to keep the lore and the, you know, to, to write canon so continuity flows from one episode to another to another without someone looking at it later on going, hey, this can't be because back in this, you know, original episode that you wrote, you know, you know what I'm... Right, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's tough. I mean, I think at a certain level you're, you're going to run into that, but I think the, I don't know, to, to me part of the fun thing or the approach to it is approaching things very broad, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the funny thing is, if I look, when I look back at, like, Kid Crimson and stuff like that, it's weirdly not specific about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, how jump points work, how, what kind of ships there are, you know, what type of guns there are, all sorts of things that, you know, when the game comes out, um, you could get a lot more specific about, but, um, you know, if you, if you kind of keep the characters engaging and you keep the storylines engaging, the tech stuff, you, I feel like you don't necessarily need to put as much of an emphasis on. Uh, so, I think part of it is just you building a universe that can accept a lot of different types too. Uh, 
you know, it's not the evil empire uh, rebel alliance sort of thing. It's like there's a lot of versatility and a lot of and, and keeping the, the the structure flexible. I think will hopefully allow us to explore a lot of different storylines in the future without feeling like that we're you know retconning a lot uh, or breaking the continuity that we've established earlier on. Right. See, I, I was impressed with Disney how once they got the Star Wars franchise, how they got together that team of people that started going through all the different lore or canon and trying to weed through the things that were added incorrectly and keep the things that were, you know, from the beginning. So right. that, that was impressive. And, you know, I can see you doing something similar little by little by reading your thread, by reading the stuff that comes out, and by seeing the direction that Chris is moving everything in and his, both his 10 for the chairman whenever he talks to in one of his interviews. So I'm, I'm pretty solidly behind what you're doing. I think what I was looking for in that one was in the end it's got to be a game and it's got to be playable and at some point you have to add more to it, right? And sometimes, yeah. Um, what is the biggest challenge right now in creating this universe where you've got a time... You, you pretty much, when you're writing a book, you can write book after book after book and expand on it, right? But this is something that's going to go live in the next 18 to 24 months. And that puts a time limit. What, what is the biggest challenge you have in having that timeline and having such a vast a vast universe to fill uh, uh, uh yeah i mean it's it's interesting because again it's it's leaving enough room for exploration having what comes out when the game launches be make sense and be cohesive uh but have there be room for expansion you know, so it's not, we don't necessarily need to get into what are the personal dietary hygiene habits of the Banu, if we can get into that in three years, you know, right. if, you know, uh, but still having, making sure that everything makes sense and connects and, you know, the, the alliances make sense and the social structures make sense. Um, yeah, I feel like it's just, it's leaving, we need to pick our battles in a sense. We got to figure out what's the, the heart of, what needs to be told and set up, and then not ignore the other stuff, but just not illuminate on it, if that makes sense. Oh, like, it does. Uh, so I think that's going to be the big, because yeah, you're right, I mean, it's a, it's a lot, a lot to get done, and a yeah, lot of... A thousand uh, systems, or is that a thousand planets? It's like a thousand systems with planets and... It's not a thousand systems. But it's, it's not. Luckily. Uh, yeah, luckily. Hey, ten years down the road, you never know. <laughs> Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, it could be. Uh, but yeah, I think initially, I can't remember what the, the, the tally is. I think it's around the... Uh, 100, right? 100. Yeah, there was a stretch goal earlier on that expanded to 100. I think uh, it's 100, and then there's planets that bring it up to 6 or 7, right? It's yeah, the, the planets make it a little trickier. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I believe the original stretch goal was, was 100 or so. More. so I, I look at it like you've got... You know, if you look at it like an onion at the very center, and you've got like the core, what's the game about, and what are we doing? And then the layers are, you're building outwards. So you're building the core, I see that. How much are you going to incorporate feedback or lore that's written by other people other than CIG in the future? You've opened up the lore builders to us to you know give you input. Is there going to be a point that you open up something like that for us to help fill in the universe, like planetary lore and what groups might be there? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, I think the the, and the tricky thing, and I mean, the lore builder stuff has been has been good because also, like I said, I, I put the um, I have a Excel a running Excel sheet with all the pirates that people came up with uh, in that thing. So it's a great just sort of grab bag of like, hey, we need a pirate to occupy the system. Just go and grab that one and throw it. Uh, it's you know the the tricky thing is it's, it's just because there are things behind the scenes that we have factored in that we can't comment on, it becomes tricky to kind of contextualize lore requests, in a sense, because uh, we don't want to uh, inadvertently kind of spoil anything, because we still want it to be a fun game that you would get to experience. Uh, and that was sort of the intent behind the lore builder, was that it was not necessarily stuff that has a direct influence on game mechanics, so 
I could be a little bit more uh, verbose in my explanation of what we needed. Uh, but I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a possibility. Again, you know, it's, there's some really talented people who are contributing to the site. So uh, if, we, if we kind of find stuff that, and actually, I mean, OES, the, uh, the clandestine secret secret service spy agency was was a fan created thing. So okay, having a somewhat big part of, of the universe. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm throwing you some questions that weren't on our list. It's like it's very you know. I and now we're done with that one. Um, it, it's just I, I look at what you bring to the bring to Star Citizen and Squadron Forty Two as one of the most important elements because when I played the Wing Commander games in the past, it was always that engaging storyline that brought right. us back over and over again. Right. So with and and this is you know this isn't a question to make you feel uneasy, but it's like you've got a lot of weight on your shoulders. Oh no, totally. Yeah. How My many? Tell me that. How many people are in your? Well, does Chris tell you that every day? <laughs> no, my ulcers. Okay, your ulcers. <laughs> How many people are on your team working with you? Uh, we're we're sort of in the process of expanding, but right now it's it's two. Two people writing everything. So far, uh, yeah. I mean, we we're in the process of talking to some other people to try to fill out the team, but um, but yeah, it's been uh, well. I mean, obviously, the designers help, you know, uh, and Ben writes stuff for us, you know. Uh, oh, nice. yeah. But um, yeah, sort of at the, at our at the moment, there are two of us. Okay. Couple more questions, and then I guess we can call it quits. The you've had some great, um, I, I guess you could say, some fiction in the jump points. Has there been a plan on releasing that as a compilation inside of the store yet? I I'm not sure. I remember somebody had talked brought that up, but I'm not sure if it's what the where that is, if that's been decided upon, or if they're still discussing it. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, and and in your last lore builder, you said that there's some new fiction coming out. Is it what we've been reading in the com link, or is it something else that's coming out soon? Well, we're we're trying to kind of backlog. So we, you know, uh, the 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 Dateline one that we just started, uh, and then we're we're actually working on building a couple more in the pipeline so we have you know some kind of back-to-back um, -back serials coming out soon so yeah we have a uh, a host of writers that we're sort of talking to about serials as well as jump point stories as much uh, content as we can and and these fictions are more to build the backstory not to build the game themselves still right um yes and no, some of it is is hinting at some kind of game mechanics. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of the the, the writers that we're, we're contracting with are uh, not as intimately familiar with the game uh, and what's going on and stuff like that. So some of it is just is just more about telling entertaining stories in this, this universe. Uh, some of it is is alluding to uh, more games. And we're you know we're obviously not trying to do anything that, that directly conflicts with. What the reality of the game is intended to be, uh, but um, uh, and so that's why you know the designers will read and review uh, fiction such as to make sure it's not okay. uh, directly clashing with it. So yes, yes and no, I guess. All right. So oh well, it's like I've been reading the stories. I got Kazan and I guess a couple of others that allude to the Lynch fever, and I kind of read between the lines and go, game comes out that might have something going on there. Is that like something, you know, is that one of some, what you're alluding to, that some, some of these stories may have things that are going on in the universe? Yes. Well, the news, the news updates are, are, are a different piece. Uh, yes, those are, those are probably a bit more tied into the game. Sometimes, like, we had a, there was a, a bounty hunter one about the bounty hunters guild that we we're having an internal discussion about whether, how uh, exclusive or elite we wanted the guild to be and there were sort of two camps and so we couldn't figure it out so we ended up writing this post that was emulating the argument between members of the bounty hunter guild just to see how people would react to it and see which way the sort of the, the community was leaning 
so some of that stuff is is more likely, I think, to appear in the game. Like Lynch's Fever, you know, could be something that pops up. Uh, you know, I, I would have to really talk to the designers about that. But uh, but yeah, hopefully it's it's you know the characters like the senators are you know are the senators that are going to be in the Senate when you you know barring anything happening to them uh, when the game comes out. So it's definitely introducing characters, it's introducing setups and you know stuff like that. So uh, yeah. Hi. Um, and last question is about timeline. The stories and the lore that we've gotten to date, would that be things that are prior to the actual events that are to take place in Squadron 42? Or are they just totally not in that timeline at all? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invoke a no spoiler. <laughs> all right, no, that, that's fine. Uh, it's just that you're, you're releasing lore, and if it's after Squadron 42, it's kind of, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not good. But, but yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... All right. Sure. You got it. You could do that. I'd rather not know ahead of time. I'm one of the people that I'm thankful that there's not going to be a real beta or alpha of Squadron 42 because I want it to unfold as I play. And that's what brought me into this. Well, that's the interview. I do have one question from a fan, but I'm kind of like embarrassed to ask it. He really was insisting that I ask if you guys would write me into the into the world as a reporter. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I was like, that's cool. But, you know, it's like us subscribers, we get something somewhere. So that would be cool. All right, all right. Yeah. That's something to consider. Yeah, because I think I'm going to get my Drake information runner, and that's what I'm going to use for my reportership. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm definitely going to talk to you again as time goes on. Is that okay? Oh, definitely. All right, David, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. You have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, everyone. My name is m for monkey and I'm addicted to a game that is probably a year away from launch. I must be mad. Every day I visit the RSI site hoping for new ships to be announced, any snippets of lore that might come my way, even a hint of official news. Failing that, I just surf the forums for gossip dressed up as fact. I've read all the comlinks, all the official lore, I dare not go near the fan fiction or I'll be lost. I've only got three ships so far, but what ships? The Aurora LX during the sale that started it all, but it wasn't enough. Memories of Elite had me poring over ship stats, trying to work out which was the right ship for me. Then I saw the Retaliator and had to own it. There I was, spending almost $300 on some ones and zeros, I didn't even own a PC. I must be mad. And then I found the SCAA. They all had the Starship Shakes worse than me. And their leader and her videos, every single ship review is a fight against getting out my wallet. I broke when I saw the Cutlass review. A ship to strike terror and fear into the hearts of the unwary, even if the armor is made out of paper and hope. And so, more money was flung Robert's way. I'm pretty sure I'm mad. So I bought a gaming rig, which I'll probably spend money upgrading over the next few years. I thought I'd never buy a computer again. I considered PC gaming wasn't for me anymore. One game has changed all that. And now, with the launch of the org system, what hope is there for me? Set adrift in the verse, with nothing but a ton of firepower and a clan of ships and fun-loving crazies, set to explore the galaxy that one man has made it his vision to deliver to us. Who needs sanity?